areas which is really ripe for disruption, and this is education. You know, having spent my time in telecoms and in banking and now in education, it just never stops to amaze me just how much education has not changed. So you look at early childhood development right up to universities, and I spend a lot of time at universities these days because I chair the National Student Financial Aid Scheme. Universities still look exactly as they looked when I started university. In fact, I'm sure even my grandparents, you know, attended the same universities. And they go to preschools, they look exactly the same as they may have looked many, many years ago. For those people who are privileged enough to go to preschool. When you look at classrooms, they still look like, you know, rows of classes, rows of desks, and kids are still grouped in terms of their ages. We assume that the learning and development of children takes place at the same rate as it happens, as it happened in our own generation, which in fact we all know is not true. And if you just look at that picture, a lot of schools, universities and so on still look exactly like that. 65% of the jobs of the kids that are in education today are going to be doing jobs that don't exist. Those jobs have not been invented yet. You just look at some of the jobs that are high paying jobs today that didn't exist even just 10 years ago. In companies today, we talk about social media managers, big data analysts, and all of these things. And all these jobs didn't exist only a couple of years ago. So we need to think, how are we training people? How are we developing people? Not just to acquire skills, but skills to be part of the journey of this massive revolution which is taking place, which is affecting human development. If we just look at the disruptions that are taking place in education today, we have cases where you don't need to be in a classroom to learn. You have technologies that are widely available, but a lot of them mainly depend on whether you have internet access or not. So that's why, you know, having worked in telecoms 20 years ago in this country, we were talking about, and the government was talking about, how we can make data available free, especially just like you make water is a basic human right. In education, we should be able to provide access to data actually for free for young kids so that they can have access uh, to these opportunities. And unfortunately, I guess because of the power of telecoms companies and so on, 20 years later, we still have not introduced the E-rate that we thought we would introduce in education to enable access to education, enable access to content, enable access to all these technologies that are so important in human development. So in look at the picture of this little girl, which is in the, in, the, in the slide here, that little girl needs to have the basic knowledge of how to code, of how to be involved in robotics, and how to make things work using coding language. Because as my kids always often said, what's going to happen in the world is those people who are able to not just make robots work, but are able to, progress, to program some of these amazing innovations of the future, will not only be the ones that rule the world, but they'll create opportunities for leisure for themselves. And my kids always used to say, you know, you must chill like a white man. Meaning, because they see, you know, you have a lot of people who can make things and they can change the world. And they have a lot more time for leisure because a lot of those things that they create are able to multiply in a way that makes it possible for them 
to actually live a really comfortable life. Now, we've got to make sure that we continue to disrupt education. We've got to look at the whole spectrum, the whole ecosystem of education. How we think about curriculum that is taught in schools, how we think about making sure that we're making and converting teaching to be a pursuit, a professional pursuit, where people go because we are attracting the smartest people to get into education, as opposed to what's happening at the moment, where if you wanted to be a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer, and you didn't get the good marks, you end up in teaching. We've got to change the way that we think about teaching, because without quality teachers, we can never have quality teaching. So it's absolutely important that we rethink who gets into education. You know, the whole world is still involved in these standardized tests. So we set tests that check for progress and check for ability based on age during especially the school years. We've got to rethink how we assess human development. We've got to rethink access, as I was saying earlier. Access to data and access to the internet should actually, especially in the education context, should be a basic human right that we must actually make possible and make available to a lot of our people, especially in the context of the African continent. How we think about pedagogies, in other words, the art of learning and teaching should be very different because a teacher can no longer be the fountain of knowledge. Children from a very young age today come to the classroom already with a huge amount of knowledge, with a huge amount of access to information, access to data. So the role of the teacher can never be the one that we're traditionally used to, where the teacher stands in front of the class and they are the fountain of knowledge. They should be the facilitator of the acquisition of knowledge. How we think about subjects, for instance, subjects at schools as well at, as at universities are still taught in silos. So you go and do it to a, a math class, you go to a history class, you go to a geography class, you go to sometimes an English class or a Zulu class, but life actually doesn't work like that. Life does not work in silos. So we've got to develop pedagogy which is integrated, which integrates knowledge, because life is a lot more integrated than how we think about how a classroom actually looks like. You know, we're, we're doing this at Future Nation School, so our teachers, must know more than just their subject which they teach. In a classroom, you could have a number of teachers teaching children in different things. We do a lot of projects, because when you do projects, the number of skills that you need to develop, there may be writing skills, there may be skills of research, there may be skills of working with others, there may be skills of making sure that you can present, you can you know, uh, communicate whatever it is that you are teaching or learning. So we need a new way of how we think about the whole education system. And there are a number of cases where this is already happening. This is already happening where there's a complete rethink of the role of education in schools. But what's going to be a lot more important is that as machines replace humankind, as the skills that are required are replaced by robots. There's some of those fundamental things that are going to be important for us to develop for young people. The ability to have grit, the ability to be resilient, the cognitive skills to distinguish between right and wrong, the ability to solve problems from a very young age, the ability, especially in the context of the noise that we have, to deal with the massive information which technology itself is generating. You just look at the amount of information which social media is generating. A lot of people get lost in this mass of information. You know, you have people who spend their days just trolling social media sites, but they can't see the wood from the trees. They can't analyze information. 
They can't really think. They have no time to reflect. We need to create a lot more time to build character in schools whilst we're focusing on building the skills, especially those skills that must be part and parcel of the education system. So teaching coding from preschool should be like teaching language, should be like teaching Zulu or teaching English or teaching French. Teaching robotics should be a basic subject that is taught from preschool. But whilst we're doing all of that, we need to make sure that we're building character of these young people. Because what we don't want is a situation where we're going to be producing a lot more Zuptas. <laughs> In the context of the African continent, if you just think back and you read history books, the first industrial revolution was about where people like Christopher Columbus could find spices, alternative sources of food, or alternative sources of resources. The second industrial revolution was almost the same. It was about, you know, where do we find coal, where do we find gold, where do we find steel? The Africans were subjects of those revolutions. In the third industrial revolution, where we've seen significant growth of penetration of technology, including in the African continent, Africans started to play some role, but it was at the periphery in the third industrial revolution. We cannot afford, as Africans, to be a subject again in the fourth industrial revolution. And what is going to be important here in the context of the call by students as an example for decolonized education is about how do we make sure that in the context where knowledge is power, the knowledge of indigenous cultures, indigenous beliefs, indigenous solutions becomes part and parcel of what is taught in schools. Because unless we do this, we are again going to be the subject of the fourth industrial revolution. The fact that we're here in this conference organized by Singularity University is actually part of an indication that if we're not careful about how we think about developing and creating the African knowledge systems, we're going to be subjects of other people who see opportunities at our doorsteps. So we've got to change this as Africans, as policymakers, as governments, as entrepreneurs. And when we just think about some of the key things in human development, how we get born, how we acquire knowledge, how we're prolonging our lives, how we may be solving our problems, including problems in areas such as health or medicine and so on, there have always been a lot of knowledge going back centuries in Africa. It was never documented. So we've got to change this. We've got to start documenting some of the knowledge, the beliefs, the cultures, the solutions which have always been there, and other people documented them and took them as if it was their own. And that gave them power, because knowledge is power. So we've got to change this as Africans. So we're starting to think, some of us are starting to think how we actually do this. We're not, in fact, we're not just thinking about it. We're starting to do research to document indigenous knowledge systems, which are going to be very important, because if we can proffer these as some of the solutions to the problems of the world, and we can solve some of the problems of the world, only then will we be part of this fourth industrial revolution, not as subjects, but as people who are part of solving the problems of the world going forward. So education has to not only develop the technical skills, but we have to focus on building upright people. I thank you. <laughs>